Thank you so much. Our featured artist this week is Fiona Kaemba, and she is the founder and creative a director of Anea Arts, an art brand that is inspired by making people from different walks of life feel seen through art. Her vision for Anea Arts is to be a one-stop shop for a wide variety of artwork as Fiona continues to see the impact of representation within our community and beyond. So I'd now like to take an opportunity to introduce you to um, this evening's spoken word artist. Wakefield Brewster is also known as the Lyrical Pitbull and he is a professional poet and spoken word artist. Since January 1999, Wakefield has been known as one of Canada's most popular and prolific performance poets. He's a Black man born and raised in Toronto by parents hailing from the beautiful island of Barbados, and he has resided in Calgary since 2006. He has spoken across Canada, several states, and makes countless appearances on a regular basis in a variety of ways for a myriad of reasons throughout each and every single year. Throughout his career, Wakefield has been published in several anthologies, including T. Griot's, The Great Black North, The Calgary Project, and The Black Prairie Archives, an anthology. In 2019, he was appointed as the very first resident poet and spoken word artist of the Grand Theatre House in Calgary, Alberta. The significance of this honor is the timing as it came to pass while the Grand was recovering from the well-publicized toxic, toxic workplace issues and a historic lack of diversity and inclusion. Finally, Wakefield sits on the board of directors of the EAR Society, the Emergency Artist Relief Society, providing emergency relief funding and affordable health care for artists. Please join me in welcoming Wakefield Brewster. Hello, good afternoon, good evening, warmest welcome. My name is Wakefield Brewster and I'm a professional poet and spoken word artist. And I guess I'm going to share some of my poetry with you. The very first piece that I'd like to present is a piece called Black Lit. And there's a few entendres in there, but you'll figure it all out. This poem is a snapshot, per se, many snapshots of how I believe I move through this world as a Black man. I swallow some blackboard paint so I can paint the word ain't a word spitting ink or chalk I still talk a fax machine paradox proper truth stopper can't stop me or mock me European MCs can't top me when a brother gets a hold of technology it's microphone recology dealing with your land foot and can't stop a pathology I offer no apology for bovine or swine domesticated equine for mankind my own mine up in mixed artistic with linguistic and i slung a hot rock like basquiat when he brought the black thought bleeding paint upon paper he changed and then deranged a sight of man the earth shaper he closed the eye caper and some years later since my brother's life broke i realize i am a smudge a perfect brush stroke with pretty colors pretty colors i am orange and yellow and red i surprise myself when poetically bled myself I was tongue twisted up like a dread with thoughts that rot sticking up in my head thrust back to life like Lazarus stripe had me strike me a hazardous pose wide open with wrists and neck exposed liquid life trickling eclectic flows from my veins pure fire voodoo rains funeral pyre my heated aspiration to be an element not simply elemental or even instrumental, but a song and a symphony with self-pity sympathy. I'm conducting those in the first row who think they know. I make them all play second fiddle if they don't jump out the middle. 
and flee like they was escaping the passage. Feces and vomit on the slavery comet founded inspiration in black and broken bones. The sounds of the lands that we call our homes and we can all hear it drawn to its timbre like rips to cracks, licks to backs, feet to axe. Funny how we stood taller when we lost our toes and held our heads high in a regal manner, defying the yokes, learning the language to create great stains, kings and queens now bound in chains and walking like gods, unlike the ghosts of our gracious hosts, now passed on to the land of duppies, weighted down by the shackles of brutality that they constructed. Inside the hall of shame, each one has been inducted. Back to the books, back to the beginning, back to the future, what we were and what we are. Back in the black hiding in the back row, back in the black like these cats don't know, black like my namesake, black like death row, black like like rum cake, black like Afro, black like my Taekwondo brother's Afro dojo, because you can't make wake a blank slate, because on the willing you can't reap a rape. I take your shots like I'm in the Russian system, off the shoulder, wrist right, to the throat, I'm a dissum, and I'm a talk louder, and I'm a walk prouder. I'm leading by design, because this hour is mine. I leave you with the fever, then you let catch a slap from the Anosho Bashobi and Galozi of rap. This here is the evolution. Amoeba to man, grunt to griot, slavery to bravery, cryptic like messages written on rice, rolled up in blunt papers, burned like a foremother's at the stake, hung like a forefather's dancing from trees, a painful slow waltz done in black and broken knees. Please, please, please help me find the method. I talk so much that my teeth itch and my hair hurts, lyrical spurts. I try and I try and I try. You say you want a sensitive man and then you hate me when I cry. I gotta internalize and re-energize and represent because you know my words quick clever can never be spent. And in this industry, no poem C mediocrity can mess with me. Though it's not all I'll be in this here reality, I'm a fluid cause y'all know it. Black is poetry. See, thank you. Thank you very much. My second poem is inspired by the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, and also the murder of one of my friends in 1999, died very much the same way, murdered by a security guard on the concrete uh, pavement of the parking lot of Loblaws. And this was in Scarborough in 99. I'm from Toronto, Scarborough, and his name, say his name, Patrick Chan. So this is for George Floyd, Patrick Chan, all those before, all those that happened that same day and all those that are still happening, especially those right now. This poem is taught, is titled Blackout. 2020 is supposed to represent perfect vision. Coincidentally, cultures be on courses of collision. Pressuring the people into doings of division, debating, demonstrating, getting down with demolition. Coming crystal clearly on the coattail of the COVID. Same old shit story, put you in the novid. Gotta stop a running man, click bang, go did but nothing truly rocked me like the death of G Flo did. Don't believe the hype or the news or the lie. For every day my brother from another mother die. Goodbye how I missed her, lovingly I kissed her. Every day we miss a sister from another mister. Death defying daylight so that everybody saw another daily modern lynching under Jim Crow law. The woo had always warned us better get your shit in check. Because even though I got your back, you best protect your neck. I'm shaking when I show my wallet or even cash a check. I know this cop, he's going to call it. His life was under threat. He's popping off his pistol like the bullet owed a debt. My brain and his ballistic going to have a tete-a-tete. -tete. A situation might arise that you did not expect. Immediately in their eyes, now you looking suspect. Though now we're living freer, we also live in fear. 
for we know Mr. Officer is also overseer. Check the etymology, my message move in clear. Spectacular vernacular puts vision on the veer. He's the long arm of the law, but he's lawless on the land. He's the leading cause of black death. He's the bubonic man. He's the bully and the bouncer, a monkey man in dress. We can't cup this monkey no flock up here in stress. Even if you see your day in court, it's full court press. Next, they put the fullness of your life upon duress. He's the first line of authority in the master, master plan. A cop can kill you quicker than the average con can. With riot gear and weaponry, with steel toe boots to step on thee, the spawn of criminology enhanced by new technology. Rounding up the black sheep, said to the herder. Slaughter in the streets is now akin to man and murder. Helen Keller flashbangs above the gun clatter. Tell me how the fuck you gonna hear that Black Lives Matter? There is no denying this priority is higher. Historically, it's never white lives coming under fire. This land of opportunity, all built for one community, instead of seeking unity, shall punish with impunity. The reasons for our marching are their methods and their madness. Honoring our elders who fought hard but never had this. Power of assembling and of gathering and of speech. Black cats couldn't even bathe on Whitey's beach. Now we making moves and moving mountains mobilizing. Raising fists around the world to garnish globalizing. And sometimes in the same way, we all find truth fiction wary. Number 45 is rolling out the military. The military marches. The marching turns to mobbing. The mobbing needs a muting. But now it's turned to robbing. The robbing got relentless and led to all the looting. So number 45, he simply said to start the shooting. Brandishing a Bible to allow his ill behavior. Acting like a judge, jury, sentinel, and savior. Encroaching with his evil up until 11th hour. He ain't the only one who must be parted from their power. Hands on law, fists on flex, guns on draw, knees on necks. Hands on law, fists on flex, guns on draw, knees on necks. Impossible to make a stand when flattened to the floor. I'd ask my brother Patrick Shan, but he ain't here no more. We lost him 20 years ago, exactly to this plate. And even though they stuffed him out, we all still see his light. Legislation lacking, and we got to lift the lack out. Politic and politic and plans, we got to back out. Freedom fighters falling into floss and force the flag out. So join me when I say that every day will be a blackout. Thank you, Wakefield, and our condolences. Thank you. My last poem, thank you for holding space for me on that. My last poem is about a poem of self-empowerment. And I think a lot of us have been feeling that feeling. Lack of control, lack of personal power even. So I like to say that this is a power that reminds of us about conviction when we really believe in a thing and being a person when we run across that adversity saying you can't, please remember two things. You probably can, and you probably should. And this poem is titled, I Can't. I can do this. After a decade of delivery on the MIC, unbelievably people still asking me, what can you do with poetry? That question used to make me angry. It used to get me hot. Now I tell them have a seat and ask them how much time they got. For you see, with poetry, I can. Duly dance down those same holes of learning where I once had the yearning to be a well-accomplished human with a 4.0, but my GPA was sadly way far below. I never got the knack of the educational flow. They made me sit still, so I stood still. 
I can confidently, comfortably cruise into classrooms where I was once coerced to create a captured, cornered mental state so I could clearly create a way to hate my own mind by my educators. They were educators. They formed a form to form my formative years, tainted with intolerance and a tidal wave of tears that sailed all of my dreams away from me. For they likened my self-image with one of stupidity. It was all that I heard and all that I could see. I can now be free. Where I was once imprisoned by a mental prism, my errant splay thoughts were like hot colored rocks, endless ammunition for the slings of possibility, but impossibly. All of my targets eluded me, for I was living in the kingdom of couldn't be me. I couldn't see the lock, so I didn't need the key. And when they finally let me go, they said, you don't know poetry. I can versify being victimized into a valiant victory, verified that when you vilified, you eventually got to deal with me. The transformation was tremendous. I took the word stupid and I made it stupendous. I began to manhandle the land of language that languished in apathetic and anonymous anguish. I did decide to dissect and divide indefinitely, indubitably what diction was doing to me. Stab a psyche with a simile, sometimes left of fantasy, so as to step off in to a skeleliquy, ail the English alphabet with an oral, oral atrocity. I can wear the face of mental agility, dispel the myth of dental fragility, and proudly embrace my so-called disability. ADD, ADHD, OCD, PTSD. Now I've made an acronymphomaniac out of me, and never once before have I so ever loved ME. I can. Turn my inventive imagination into a physical infatuation, not like sugar, not the hard refined, not like sweetener, not the artificial can. I don't need heroin because I'm a heroine, my own mind. Spend some time with my mentality and what I did find is I can learn. And poetry taught me when the truth is unfurled, I'm the only one man who can change my world so I can do anything. What can I do with poetry? I ask you, why don't you tell me? Wakefield Brewster, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you so much, wakefieldbrewster.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Daniela? Yes. So um, our guest speakers today, we're very happy. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Ama Gamfoa. Um, Ama is a Ghanaian Canadian womanist mental health therapist, registered social worker, community researcher, writer, and social justice advocate. Engaged in the, social, in the field of social work for the last nine years, her expertise is rooted in supporting and counseling youth, Black and racialized communities, and survivors of gender-based violence. Holding a demonstrated history of meaningful program development and research, she has advanced and strengthened the impact of diverse Black-centered programs and initiatives across the greater Toronto area. A highly sought after speaker and writer, she is featured on CBC's Metro Morning, Ontario Morning, Fresh Air Radio, She Led Africa, Toronto Star, and the first Canadian Afrocentric social text. She currently leads Women's Health and Women's Hands networking young black women's project a holistic mentorship program for black identifying women ages 16 to 25 as founder and lead clinical therapist of women of womanist healing ama is determined to create empowering holistic resources that enrich black women and communities ability to heal thrive and connect through mental health counseling and therapeutic supports, Womanist Healing offers an African diasporic lens to healing, mental wellness, 
and liberation. Thank you so much for being here, Amma. Thank you for having me. Second guest is Dr. David S. Davis is a professor emeritus in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary. Prior to getting graduate degrees in social work, he obtained an MA degree specializing in African Canadian and African American history from the University of Waterloo, where he worked with one of Canada's leading historians on Black Canadian history, Dr. James Walker. During his career, Dave has contributed publications uh, to the discipline of African, uh, African Black Canadian history, um, Canadian social welfare history, along with pieces focused on contemporary issues confronting the African dia diaspora in Canada. He's also co-produced the documentary, We Are the Roots, Black Settlers and Their Experiences of Discrimination on the Canadian Prairies, which received the 2018 Governor General Award for History uh, and Community Programming. He has worked with the following organizations, the Association of Black Social Workers in Nova Scotia, the Ontario Black History Society, the Race Relations Foundation of Canada, and the Black Canadian Studies Association. As well, he's contributed to the development of the recently formed Federation of Black Canadians and is a co-editor of the volume entitled Afrocentric Social Work, a best practice in working with African communities in the diaspora, which was published in 2021. Um, welcome and thank you for being with us, uh, Dr. Rust. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, um, so we just read you their very accomplished um, biographies. Um, and you may or may not know them from their community work, but for our audience tonight, what is the most important thing that they need to know about you? Maybe we can start with uh, Amma. Can I just interrupt for a second? Sorry, um, Dr. Estan Amma. I'm just going to ask if anyone is online and is able to come show you face on screen, that would be really awesome. Because I know sometimes you can't, but our guests are speaking to themselves, really. And they need to sh thank you, thank show you, them you. some love and give them some energy. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and I just want to acknowledge uh, the presence of my colleague, uh, uh, um, Dr. Dolores Mullins, who was the lead editor of our book. Uh, and was she pushed us <laughs> uh, because it was a uh, it was a it was a long process, but uh, under Dolores' leadership, uh, I just want to thank her, and I also want to thank Ama because she also contributed a, a chapter to the book, uh, and um, it's so I just want to thank both of you for your contributions to uh, the book that got published uh, last, last June, 2021. So thank you very much to both of you. I, and, and, and you can respond, I'm on. How do you start after that? Um, thank you. I don't think you have also been so critical to this journey and um, I, of course, came a lot later, but you, Dr. Dolores Mullings, Dr. Wanda Bernard, uh, Dr. Jennifer Clark have been so critical in, in creating this. And so I'm, I'm honored really and truly to, to be here with you uh, this evening. Um, and the question was, what do people, what should people know about me? Um, that I am prioritizing Black joy and Black rest as Black history slash Black Futures Month. So it's been a very useful, beautiful, reflective time for me. And I, I hope folks that are on the line are also prioritizing uh, Black joy and rest because that is also very critical for, for us. Thank you. Yes. And I, I guess my response is, is similar. Um, as I mentioned prior to being live, uh, this is uh, the first of, of several opportunities I have to um, serve on a panel and be part of a discussion. And as an educator, although um, I formally retired uh, almost over a year ago, I still think it's 
extremely important that I continue to contribute, uh, not only in terms of these forums uh, in relation to Black History Month, but uh, wherever I can to continue to make contributions so that I continue to grow as both as a person and as a social worker, social work educator. And I tell my students long before I became an academic, I was a social worker. So those are my roots. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, I was just like, I love anything that starts with a love fest. Um, <laughs> and so, and so for, and, and actually, it actually serves as a great segue because um, our next question um, highlights some of the, uh, highlights the, the fact that last week we were talking with Dr. Bernard and Dr. Mullings, uh, and we discussed that there were a, a variety of people who were initially involved in contributing to the book and who are not all able to, to participate as authors. So uh, my question for both of you is, how did you become involved in the book? And, and you started to answer this and what drew you to the book? I'm gonna start with David, please. Uh, great question. <laughs> and um, so, Every five years, the Association of Black Social Workers that's based out of Nova Scotia and particularly Halifax, Dartmouth, they, they organize and hold a conference that is attended primarily by uh, Black social workers, ranging from educators, practitioners, and community members. And at at the conclusion of the 2014 conference, um, Wanda and Dolores and I had a, a, a preliminary conversation about, well, we need to do something with these papers that were presented at, at the conference. And at the time, I was going to be the lead editor and Dr. Bernard was going to be, was going to be the second uh, uh, lead editor. However, um, and we started out in that, that manner, but uh, during the interim, I was already working on another edited book where I was lead editor uh, of a uh, volume entitled Race and Anti-Racism in Canada. And, uh, and two years after the conference, Dr. Bernard was appointed to the Senate of Canada. And so we turn to uh, our dear colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Mullins, and basically, said, well, would you take over being lead editor? Um, and Dolores jumped on it. Uh, uh, and I'm glad she did because uh, subsequent events, well, Dr. Bernard became very busy in her, her role. And unfortunately, uh, November, 2018, I was diagnosed with, with cancer and three weeks later had six hours of surgery. So even if I wanted to, there's no way I could take the lead. And in fact, I remember Dr. Mullins, when we did the book launch, she introduced me as someone who continued to work on the book project while I was hospitalized in the foothills because I was hospitalized once and then got discharged and then and had a negative reaction to chemotherapy and then spent another uh, four months. So the decision to turn the lead editorship over to uh, Dr. Mullins and then she recruited Jennifer Clark from Ryerson. And that, in my opinion, that was one of the best decisions uh, uh, I made and so that's how um, the book uh, uh, found its genesis. And, uh, uh, and um, yeah, so that's, that's, that captures 
very briefly how I became involved in this book and how the book evolved from uh, something that we said we wanted to do. And it took us six years to do. And it started out because at the conference, we had presentations not only by Black Canadian scholars, but also American Black scholars. But um, unfortunately, uh, uh, our, our Black American scholars um, didn't come through. Uh -huh. Then we decided to make a, an all Canadian volume. And once again, I have to give credit to Dr. Mullins and Dr. Clark because they they recruited um, some great scholars, Canadian scholars, who ultimately made the contribution. And, and we had a collection of contributors that were academics, right. practitioners, and right. students. And, 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 and which is a great segue, thank you, Dave, to Ama. Um, how did you become involved in the, in the project? Yeah, before, before I go forward, of course, like we're, we're really blessed, especially then, thank you. Um, to have you here with us and to share and celebrate in this moment. So I really, I'm really grateful that, that you're here with us and able to talk about um, all that you were able to contribute to, to this time. Thank um, you so much, Emma, for that. Uh, in terms of me, I was lucky enough to be a student of, of Dr. Jennifer Clark's at the time when, you know, some of the ending pieces um, were being completed. I was a master's of social work student and my research and ma major research paper was steeped in Afrocentric care and talking about Afrocentric knowledge. It highlighted Black art as a way of resistance. And so it's beautiful that today we also started off with spoken word. Um, and of course, I mean, I was deeply excited to be able to contribute to something that's empowering, intersectional, and, and really allowing us to celebrate the wisdom that Black people have. And that, that's, you know, really my introduction. I really, in, in my master's, did not want to focus on the deficit. Black folks know what their challenges are and mm -hmm. their experiences are. And so I was so committed to um, decolonizing my own mind, but really embracing and celebrating Afrocentric care and was was able to like luckily be a part of the, the project in that way. Mm. Yeah, and you speak a lot of you spoke a lot about Afrocentric care. So um, this question is to both of you. But how like how principles in your everyday life in your everyday life like in whether in uh, your personal life or your professional life? And what does that offer you? Oh, doctor, you're muted. Well, I was just saying, um, I'll go ahead and, re and, and take the first crack at responding to the question. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the fact that the event is called Sankofa Back to Africa because I think and I know that the journey of Sankofa is consistent, right? And, and returning to get is consistent. Um, I grew up in Toronto. And so I was typically like one of the only continental African folks, but I grew up with a lot of black folks, folks from the Caribbean. Um, and so I was of course, always curious about my culture and my identity. A large majority of my family doesn't live in this country. And I just was always curious about understanding in full who I was and where I came from. And so, what that has looked like for me in my personal life is just digging into the histories of, of Black people, uh, pre-colonization, but just thinking about looking at our stories and also looking at the resistance of Black people and, and the wisdom and knowledge that we've always had. Uh, because I, I, I'm from Ghana, so I've had the opportunity to go back home and that has always been a really beautiful journey. Uh, I get the opportunity to sit with my grandmother and ask her questions about her mother and you know my grandparents and that is always a really beautiful way of, of knowing where I come from in a really intentional manner. Art, of course, is a, a real way to connect to just so many different experiences of, of Blackness that are rich and, and diverse. Um, but then I also think I'm very mindful. I'm a critical social worker, so I'm always asking myself questions about what does and how does this thing, whatever I'm engaging with, empower me as a Black person? And if it doesn't, how am I going to disconnect, resist, or challenge it? Um, 
and what that's offered me is really a sense of assuredness. I think I, I live my life now as a very unapologetic Black woman. I know where I come from. And although I'm consistently evolving in a lot of different ways, um, my roots really help to keep me, to keep me grounded. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I have a lot to learn from you. <laughs> um, Dr. S. So for myself, and, and, and it talks about my, our own journey to embrace Afrocentric principles. And so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm going to date myself. So as a high school student, 15 years old, uh, I attended Dartmouth High uh, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And uh, as most of you are aware that uh, the presence of people of African descent in Nova Scotia has been long standing. And, uh, and they refer to themselves as African Nova Scotians. And I was, and the high school I went to was the largest high school in the city of Dartmouth, which was to just credit across the bridge uh, to Halifax. And um, there are only, so the population of the school was 1,500, but <laughs> I only need one hand minus one finger to count the number of black students. And there were four of us. And uh, so, it, so that was one thing because I, I started asking <coughs> uh, the question, where are the rest of the black students? Or why aren't there more black students? And then inevitably, the next question that I asked was, where are the black teachers? Because there were no teachers. And I think for me, that was the starting point for me to uh, begin to understand who I was as a young black male. And the, other, and the other event that I remember so clearly, so vivid, vividly, when I was in grade 10, was that um, we had a visit by two Black Panthers based out of Chicago that came up and spoke and associated with Rocky Jones, who was a community activist. And the highlight uh, for me was that they came to our, our high school and they engaged in a, in a debate with two of our social studies teachers who were white. And my goodness, they, those, two, those two brothers just blew these two white uh, teachers away. And, and that was probably one of the first times I had seen um, black scholars really, <laughs> well, they just, they, just, they just stood out. And that for me was the beginning of the process of me uh, be becoming interested in, in black history, black culture, whatever term you want to use. And then um, I, I completed a master's degree in, in African-Canadian history, 1977, 78, and then uh, switched into social work and uh, um, in 1980, did my MSW at U of T, came out practice in Alberta, then went back and, and Dolores Mullins and I both completed our, our PhDs in social work at Wilfrid Laurier. Mm -hmm. And my introduction to this whole area of Afrocentric social work probably started in the mid 1990s as I began reading the work of scholars such as Dr. Asante and Dr. Ann Masma from Temple University, uh, which is in the United States and uh, another British scholar, Dr. Makita Graham, 
and uh, Dr. Jerome Shearley, who has written extensively and published extensively on different aspects and dimensions of Afrocentric social work practice. And he published a volume in, I think it was 2001, that has had two reprints. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the pleasure uh, of working with Dr. Bernard around 2000, and where we published a book chapter uh, entitled Afrocentric Social Work. And we use the case, we use African Nova Scotians mm. case study. Uh, and so that, that's how I became involved and interested in this whole uh, area of uh, Afrocentric social work and the whole topic of Afrocentrism. Thank you so much. Um, actually, um, I think Ama, you hinted at this earlier and, and I just wanna let the audience members know that this is actually a question that appeared in our chat last week. Um, and we know that we didn't have an opportunity to get to it. And so we're bringing this question forward. Um, but the question was, uh, and I think you started talking about this, Ama, in terms of decolonizing your own mind, right? And so the question was, decolonizing your own mind is a very interesting statement to the questioner as a psychotherapist. Can decolonizing be adopted as a therapeutic approach? And is there research being done in this area? Well, I, I think as a therapist, you the part of the groundwork of being a therapist is already being actively involved in decolonizing your mind and what that means. And that is for many reasons. One of them is the fact that when folks are walking into therapy, they're just not walking in with themselves. They're walking in with the experiences of their parents, of their grandparents, of their great grandparents. And if we ignore that, then we are, are not looking at them and their experiences as full people. And especially, in the Canadian context, right? If mm -hmm. you want to engage in ethical social work practice, then you cannot do that in without engaging in decolonization. We, we know the history um, and the connection of social workers and whiteness in this space and the harm that it's created. Um, and you know, even if you think of, for example, the disproportionate rates of black youth in child welfare, let's say. If you're not using, using a decolonial approach, you're gonna say that black parents don't know how to take care of children, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking about the impact systemically of, of white supremacy and how folks have been disconnected from their families. Mm -hmm. And so really and truly, I think decolon decolonization is an ongoing process that is really part of the groundwork of being able to adequately support people if you're understanding that one a lot of these experiences of a co of course are intergenerational um, and you're missing the social political uh, realities of folks that are is so important and necessary in adequately being able to support them um, but you're also missing the heritage and the wisdom and the knowledge and and that's because if we don't look at and see afrocentric care as critical or as important, then we're also not seeing, okay, what's the wisdom that people are bringing forward with, within this space, right? What's the wisdom that they might've been taught by their parents or but that they hold within themselves or even the ways in which community can support them. So it is a part of engaging in ethical, uh, responsible and really responsive and trauma-informed care, right? Mm -hmm. We like to talk mm -hmm. about trauma-informed care, <laughs> Afrocentric work is also trauma-informed care. Um, and then in terms of research, I think that there, so there is a lot of information. I think part of the struggle though is we don't research ourselves enough. We don't mm -hmm. research our organizations enough mm -hmm. and get deeper into why it is we do the things that we do and how we might need to be really critical of ourselves and the practices that we have when we're engaging with folks. Um, and so I, I really wanna say that the research starts with you because there's a lot of books, right? But if you're not actually critically thinking about yourself, your work and how it is also complicit in um, upholding some of these structures, then we're gonna continue to reproduce what we continue to be doing. Of course, the Afrocentric social work text really does speak to black centered approaches. It talks about decolonization in, in great detail. 
There's also um, a book called uh, My Grandmother's Hands. And I think that that can be really helpful in terms of thinking about racial trauma, decolonization in the therapeutic space and, and some of that reflection work that um, both Black um, social workers as well as racialized or, or white folks can also look at as a, a little bit of a resource. But I, I really wanna stress the importance of folks being critical, mindful of themselves as they engage in therapy. Thank you, Emma. David? Yeah, and I, and I would like to add um, a couple points. So as, a, as someone who has gotten two degrees in social work, um, my master's at the U of T and my PhD at Wilford Laurier, um, when I reflect on those, when I reflect on those experiences and the type of education that I receive, it uh, and and I and I thank I thank the Creator for. Uh, I'm glad I did my master's in African Canadian history first, because if I if if I didn't have that background. And when I reflect on my social work education, it was colonial education for sure. Because um, first of all, um, there was no content. <laughs> there was no content related to anything in relation to people of African descent our communities, our history, culture. It was just like, it was all, the education was through the lens of whiteness. So as I reflect on, as I reflect on that experience, <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a clear attempt to, uh, and, and people say that, that are that we were erased from history. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not comfortable with using the term eraser because eraser means that we were there and then we get wiped out. So mm. we were included, period. Mm. And, and then um, once again, I'm dating myself because I, I began my master's at U of T in 1980. So some 40 years later, um, um, even today, although we've made some minor strides, uh, the educational system is still dominated by whiteness. And, and the question I ask is that what is, what damage or what impact Be, what impact has, has resulted of being a recipient of the colonial education that I received both as a master's of social work and PhD and, and with the dominance of whiteness. And uh, so I've been able to counteract that by, um, by whom I work with, uh, and who I associate in, 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 in the community. Yeah, because uh, without working with people such as Dr. Bernard, Senator Bernard, uh, Dr. Mullins, uh, my, my good colleague, Dr. Carl James, uh, and other scholars, uh, including Akua Benjamin, and not finding like-minded people in the relatively small black community in Calgary, uh, I would have never, I would have never survived as an academic, and and especially as a black ac academic working in a faculty of social work, which is very conservative, and is still dominated by uh, the paradigm of whiteness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could also just say that Dr. Wanda Bernard literally said the same thing around not being able to survive without that sense of community. And so I think it just kind of further speaks to the importance of having 
Afrocentric ways of knowing, but then also what community means for Black people, in particular when you're consistently in these like white dominated spaces. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting for me as you were talking. All I like, I, 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 I think I have a, I had a PTSD moment. I just sort of felt myself move back, you know, through through time to uh, uh, to my social work education at Miguel, and I was just like, oh yeah, I was the chick in the back of the classroom who was either crying or raging, um, and it had to do right with the sort of ever presence, reified constantly being reinforced notions of whiteness and and predominance of whiteness in the way that we talked um, to and about each other. We are going to be, I, I thank you both for your answers and I'm not bringing this to a close. We're going to be uh, switching slightly um, af after learning from last week. And I am going to first, ask a question um, that people can answer in order to be included for the draw um, for, um, for the book giveaway. And the question is, where is Dr. Est um, a, a professor emeritus? Uh, and if you can just, if you are, want to be included in the draw, you can put your answers in the chat right now, and um, there will be someone um, who is going to be monitoring the chat, who will take, who will be picking the names, and we will be getting in touch with um, winners at some point in the future. So if you'd like to be in the draw, please answer the question, where is Dr. S. Um, uh, Professor Emeritus? And it's okay to copy your friend's answers. So. Um, and so, and now the next thing that I'd like to do is to invite um, members of the audience to, once you've entered the draw, to type your uh, to type your questions for Ama um, and David into the chat, so that we'll have more time to be able to engage with questions from the audience. So, um, if you have a burning question that you'd like to ask to Ama or David, uh, please feel free to um, to type that into the chat. Um, uh, type that into the chat at this point, and we'll be able to to get. Um, to get to that. Daniela, did you want to ask one more briefly while we wait for uh, those questions to come in? Yes, I can ask one briefly. But um, before I ask the question, um, I was just thinking about my high school experience because I haven't, ex I haven't um, been out of high school for very long. And I can recall like all of you have spoken of being or feeling so isolated in a western and a eurocentric education and it's just it just goes like it doesn't it starts very young where you're you can feel that you are so different from everybody else and i can recall a lot of experiences in high school like that where i went to a predominantly white high school in a like a nicer area and so so you're just surrounded by white and the very few people you can um, connect with, you try to. And so last week, I think it was Dr. Mullings who was talking about networking and how important that is. And I wrote that down and I have it in my room, like networking, 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 so that I can build. Um, yeah, I think also Dr. Um, uh, Bernard was talking about how you can't go through this alone, like Amal was saying. So if you're a black social worker out there, Please connect with me. I'm trying to build a good network. I'm just entering the field. <laughs> I don't want her in mind. So please connect with her. No, no, of course, connect with each of us. <laughs> so sorry, Daniela. David? Well, uh, thanks for your comment, Daniela. And um, I thoroughly agree with the comments that were shared uh, with you by Dr. Mullins and, and and uh, Dr. Bernard, uh, because uh, when, when I got hired uh, by our faculty of social work in 1992, um, I, so first of all, I was the first black, first racialized uh, person that got hired in a tenure track position. And uh, <laughs> it was um, it was a lonely experience mm -hmm. uh, until I began networking. First of all, 
was in uh, Calgary's Black community, but I made sure I mean, uh, and I I did meet, uh, I met Dr. Bernard at a conference in St. Catharines in 1996, and we became good friends. And I knew, I, I've known Dolores for at least 20 years. Sorry, Dolores, I'm, 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 dating, I'm dating you. But those connections um, are, are, are so meaningful. Now, that doesn't mean to say that, that, uh, that we agree with everything um, uh, because we're all socialized, we're all brought up differently. But uh, networking uh, with other black social workers uh, is, ex is extremely important uh, for a variety of reasons, but I would say um, one of the reasons why it's important is that it, it's important for our mental health if we don't connect with others who look like us. Uh, yeah, so I just, so I just wanted to reiterate that whatever Dr. Bernard and Dr. Mullen shared with you about the importance of connecting with others, networking, being in contact, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, and um, it's some. It's not just on us. Sometimes, some one of the questions in the chat was asked by Natalie. Um, they said, "How can?" we help advocate for, for schools of social work and and social work in general, I'm guessing, to become more diverse and inclusive. So it's not just on us. So how can the school schools in general of social work and social workers as well? I'll just assume that social workers. Uh, Amma, would you like to start? Um, sure. I yeah, think go ahead. Okay, so I think Dr. Uh, Dolores Mullings last week was really speaking strongly to the fact that schools of social work need to begin to have this as a course, right? Um, you know, I graduated from my first undergraduate in 2014 and my master's in 2018. And only because I had very particular um, instructors in, and one of them of course was an editor in this book. And so that's the reason as to why Afrocentric care was um, being championed, but schools of social work need to go beyond our statements, right? We often say anti-oppressive practice. We often say anti-Black racism. We often list all these different things that we acknowledge, but what does it mean to go beyond the acknowledgement? And what does that look like concretely? So if we're concretely um, engaged or mindful or committed to addressing anti-Black racism, then how, you know, as Dr. David was putting it, how do we begin shifting the default knowledge, which is often in social work programs that is like white, um, you know, Eurocentric, and that often kind of looks at folks, as Dr. Mulling said last week, as an afterthought. So I think that this is if there was ever an opportunity, there's always been many, but now is the time. This book can be such a critical course in people's learning and education and challenging themselves and expanding themselves in ways that is often not offered in social work. Um, and especially because of the power dynamics that exist within our field. This is a, a really, really critical time for the schools of social work, but also for the Canadian Association of Social Workers to be really connected to changing social work education. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Yes. So, um, great question. <laughs> and uh, so I've been one that has been extremely critical of Canadian social work education, as well as the profession of social work. So, and, and I'll talk about social work as a profession, because I'm currently uh, involved in a project with Chris Walmsley, um, Aliyah Campbell, who's a graduate of the MSW program at Carleton, and Dr. Ber Dr. Bernard. Yeah. And we have been hired jointly by the Association of Black Social Workers and the CAS, Canadian Association of Social Workers. And 
uh, our mandate is to explore how the profession of Canadian social work has treated <laughs> or mistreated or has attempted to include uh, both people, people of African descent and African Canadian communities. And we started in September. And, uh, and based on the array of activities that we've completed thus far, such as reviewing different components of the CASW website, uh, because they have workshops, they have policy statements, based on a review. So what we did is that we, we, we sent the association uh, a list of critical milestones mm -hmm. in African Canadian history, primarily of the last century. Uh, for example, the Black Writers Congress at McGill in 1968, um, the incident uh, that involved primarily West Indian students at Concordia University in 1969, mm -hmm. uh, the destruction of Africville, founding of the Black United Front in Nova Scotia, and then uh, the founding of the National Black uh, Coalition out of Toronto in 1975. And we asked the association to review its files to see what type of responses of any uh, uh, in relation to these critical milestones. And, and to date, it's basically virtually nothing. Um, and uh, about three weeks ago, I had the opportunity of going through the, the CSW and, re and reports from 2017 to 2021. So, um, so for at least three years, from 2017 to 2020, there's in the annual reports, uh, it's like we're out of mind, out of sight. There's not nothing about uh, nothing about Afrocentric social work, nothing about Black Canadians. It's like we like what we don't exist. And in twenty and in uh, twenty twenty one, there might be there's limited uh, referencing to uh, people of African descent, including the book launch that, that we had that was sponsored by CASW last summer. Um, so that's the profession. And when it comes to Canadian social education, um, I would like to be optimistic. Uh, and saying that, and I agree with Dr. Mullins and Dr. Bernard, that, that all schools and faculties of social work should be offering a course on Afrocentric social work. But I'm gonna take it a bit further. I'm saying that this course needs to be a mandatory course mm -hmm. because uh, if you leave it uh, for people's choice, it's it, it's it's not going to receive the attention that it rightfully deserves. And then when I look across the different social work curriculums across different schools and faculties of social work, to the best of my knowledge, uh, an Afrocentric social work course in terms of faculties has been limited. So I know Dr. Bernard has offered it at the School of Social Work at Dalhousie. She's also offered at Carleton University. I think Ryerson has offered a similar course. And for the first time, uh, <laughs> uh, and I've been pushing, but for the first time last year, two of my black female colleagues here at the University of Calgary Dr. Regine King and, and Dr. Petrina Doheny offered an Afrocentric social work course. But 
if, if, if it's not a mandatory course, um, then people are missing out because uh, it, it's an important dimension of social work education and subsequently social work practice. And, and I feel very, very strongly. And the other thing uh, that I have been privy to is that I've had the opportunity to contribute to uh, UBC's anti-racist and, in, and inclusive uh, uh, action plan, uh, working with Dr. Handel Wright and Dr. Shirley Chow. And I've also been part of our faculty's anti-racism, anti-Black racism task force, where we've actually developed a, a, an action plan that we brought to the faculty and it's been accepted not only by our faculty, but our faculty council. And we've operationalized uh, some of the components, such as we now have three black scholarships uh, we offer to uh, both our BSW and uh, graduate students, uh, et cetera. And, and because it's easy, because we saw this uh, after the murder of Joy Floyd, where different schools and faculties of social work uh, put out anti-Black racism uh, statements. But for me, um, anybody, could, anybody could go on a website and produce uh, a statement. Mm -hmm. And the statements are important, but if there's no further commitment and no further action, those statements ring hollow and they have no meaning. Well, for me, they're just, they, they don't carry any weight. Thank you so much, David. I actually wrote down on a little note card. You can't say that you understand that you need change and then expect everything to look and feel the same. Um, so, um, and, and I do, and I did, I, I can do this. I'm just gonna coattail on what both you and Amma had said and then move into the next question. Um, the reason that um, the reason that such a course would need to be required is because that's how you show that it's valued. Um, that's how you show that it's valued. Um, and that honestly, if you understand what dominant culture is, you will understand that dominant culture folk will not value this unless you show them why and how to value. Um, this kind of knowledge. Um, there's another question here um, for you. What therapeutic, I think they mean techniques, but what therapeutic tech or adaptations do you use to locate or center clients in the Afrocentric therapeutic process? Yeah, I think that, um, of course, Afrocentric counseling includes and embeds thinking about, talking about culture, spirituality, uh, connection to community. Um, for folks, I, I, I'm guessing by the ways that the question is also asked, they're thinking about, um, you know, things like potentially like CBT or, but for me personally, um, one of the things that I have found helpful in the past is narrative therapy. Um, there is an amazing uh, narrative therapist from South Africa, um, Dr. Nazulo, and she helped to co-create the Tree of Life. Um, that is a really, really amazing practice that allows folks to talk about their roots, um, their histories, their families, and then also from those spaces, understanding and celebrating the strengths and then going towards their future. So the Tree of Life by Dr. Nazulu is something that is uh, really, really helpful, both in individual counseling as well as in group counseling. Um, and then narrative therapy more generally on one-to-one -one interactions because it offers that space of double listening. So you're hearing, understanding the impact of bring maybe racial trauma, but you're also hearing where's the resistance, where's the community, where does culture fit in with this, right? How does your connection with your grandmothers or your aunties or you know a church or a mosque how does all of those um parts of yourself also connected to supporting your health and well-being um and i think it also offers the ability to have more expansive conversations that are not as um maybe cut and dry when you think of other uh therapeutic modalities that are often like very just dismissive or or not connected to like that full holistic picture of of afrocentric care in therapy Thank you. 
Danielle, did you want to? Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, there was one more question in the chat. Um, Mario asked, we have been introduced different ways of knowing the Afrocentric epistemology, at least through the guests in at last and this second and this week of the three part series. So not having read Afrocentric social work, the book yet, how can the guests, how can the guests speak to these different similar ways of knowing? Not sure I understand the question. Um, Dr. David, were you trying to speak? I wasn't sure. Yeah. Mary, yeah, you I, may need to help us. I, I, I need greater clarity in terms of what's being asked because I, I, yeah. I really didn't That's understand right. the question. Um, Mario Spiler, are you still here? Um, oh, they're here. Yeah, I see them talking in the corner. Mary, did you want to ask out loud or retype if that's if you're more comfortable? But and in the interim, we actually probably will have we may have time for one more. So uh, while Mario is rephrasing, um, mm -hmm. if if there's anyone else who would like to add something in the chat, please feel free. I really appreciated actually, um, Dr. S, when you were talking about the kind of shift that took place for you as a high school student when the Black Panthers came, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the kind of, and I, and I can totally see, like, when you said that, I was like, you got to see a Black Panther in high school? Like, <laughs> that was literally what went through my mind. And what I was thinking was, what would my life be like if I, if I had got, you know, had, if I'd been able to sit in my high school, um, my high school auditorium and, and listen to Black Panthers and listen to Black Panthers um, going on your description, be excellent, right? Like in terms of speaking to, you know, to the realities of your life, but also speaking to the realities of their lives relative to the educational system that you were, that you were ensconced in. Do you know what I mean? Because it was your social studies t-shirts, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I really, I really appreciated that. And really sort of for myself and thinking about that, that kind of, flipping of the switch as, as also part of that decolonization process. Do you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. the four kids in the auditorium, right? We're like, flip, 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 flip. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it, it was such, so <laughs> I've lived long enough to have had numerous times to reflect on, on, on what I saw and what I heard and my, and the lasting impact that that event has had on, on my life. Mm. Uh, and probably in an indirect way, because at 15 years old, I didn't know I was gonna go on and do a, 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 a PhD and then and, and engage in all of this scholarly and teaching, but in an indirect way, having witnessed what I, what I, what I witnessed, having heard what I heard, uh, I'm sure that deep down in, in, the, in the lobe of my brain, that that had, some influence on my decisions to uh, pursue higher education uh, because when I when I did my sabbatical at Dalhousie with Dr. Bernard in 1999, and I remember this, and I went to a gospel concert at another high school in Dartmouth called. Prince Andrew, uh, pardon the term. And uh, during the break, I like to wander and observe. And I stumbled across uh, a hallway that had composite pictures of students who had graduated for the past 15 years. 
those are rough sometimes. <laughs> and and <laughs> those are rough sometimes. I was I was somewhat because uh, there were very so on two dimensions. So there were very few black graduates. Mm -hmm. 15 year period coming from this high school. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that made me even more depressed was that there were, uh, so out of the, the small number of black graduates, the number of black male graduates was even smaller. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I just, I, <laughs> I just shook my head and said, and I and I won't I I won't use the words that I that I thought of, but I'll just paraphrase. I said, "What in the hell is going on here in this education system here in Nova Scotia?" Because uh, over a thirty over a thirty year gap when I was a high school student to when I I went to this high school in 1999, uh, proportionally, not much had changed. Right. So thank you for your comments, Melissa. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's really important to underline um, so for your story, the existence of of uh, the you know uh, the hundreds of years existence of a uh, you know of of um, uh, sorry it's a black of a black Canadian community. Do you know what I mean? We're talking about people who have lived in this area for hundreds of years and are oh, not yes. receiving the education. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, we're going to go back to Mario now. Um, Daniela, do you want to ask it again? Please. Yes, Mario provided us with some clarification. So they said. I was asking about the similarities and differences of ways of knowing being expressed about Afrocentric knowledge and as a way of differentiating it's the predominantly white ways of knowing. Right. So thinking about the differences and the similarities between Afrocentric ways of knowing and other, we'll call them dominant or white ways of knowing. Um, could I ask, um, who would like to comment first? How about that? I would love to hear Dr. David first, if that's okay. Well, um, I'm not sure that uh, that there. If we're talking about the Euro Eurocentric uh, epistemology, the Eurocentric way of knowing. As compared to the Afrocentric uh, paradigm or Afrocentric ways of knowing, there are no similarities because the 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 core principles of Afrocentrism and uh, so the importance and I I can't remember all the, the seven core features, but the importance of spirituality the importance of that everything is interconnected, et cetera, et cetera. They, they emerge in direct uh, opposition or diametrically opposed to uh, the Eurocentric principles. Another one, so Eurocentrism uh, emphasizes uh, individuality, uh, the importance of self, where the Afrocentric paradigm de-emphasizes or decenters individualism and focuses more on the collective. So uh, uh, the basic fundamental principles that are associated with, with, with the Afrocentric paradigm, there are no similarities. Um, uh, in relation to uh, the Eurocentric paradigm. Even uh, how we conduct research and the types of research that, that uh, Afrocentric scholars engage in um, and that we utilize uh, are quite different from uh, the dominant positive 
uh, quantitative uh, paradigm that has dominated social sciences for years and years. And it's only been in the last maybe 20 years that we are using different, more uh, liberatory, a more uh, emancipatory forms of research methods and, and uh, research designs that are more inviting. So uh, we don't do research on our communities. We do research with our community. And quite often, uh, the priorities in terms of research questions come from our community. And, and uh, in terms of partnerships, it's not that uncommon to see that when we engage in research studies or research projects that we, so we have, we make use of advisory committees. And in one project that I was involved in with um, Dr. Bernard, Dr. Carl James, and Akua Benjamin, uh, and it was, we received a major grant from the Community Institutes of Health Research. And one of the things that we said that we would do that predominantly in terms of hiring, that we would hire research assistants, not only situated in the academy, but we made sure that we, we hire research assistants and coordinators from the community because we saw that as a form of reciprocity because we couldn't do the research without the involvement of the respect of black communities in Halifax, Toronto, in Calgary. But we also felt both a professional, uh, moral <laughs> and cultural responsibility to give back to the community. And one of the ways that we clearly demonstrated that was having community members be actively involved uh, as research assistants. And I would say that 95% that of the people who worked on, on the project in the three cities, at least 95% were uh, were people of African descent, mm -hmm. and for us, it didn't matter their level of skill set, as long as they were keen, curious, uh, and willing to learn. Mm -hmm. Those were the three attributes that were far more important than having uh, just solely looking for people who had years of experience, because we recognized that uh, opportunities for uh, uh, black students and black community members were virtually non-existent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, okay, thank you. Emma, did you wanna have, did you wanna give us our final comment? No, she does not. What do I say after that? I'm, I'm so happy <laughs> I asked and I knew that you would speak in, in the ways that you did. So I, I have nothing else to add. Right. Thank you. So I am looking at the time and I want to respect the, the time of, of our panelists and the time of our audience. Um, Daniela, do you want to start thanking everyone and shutting this down? Absolutely. So I want to thank you, Dr. S and Amma for being here today. It's just been wisdom upon wisdom upon wisdom. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your contributions and writing the book. Um, thank you for representing us as we are often underrepresented or just ignored in general. Um, and thank you to our audience for being here, for wanting to learn more about Black people, not just our struggles, but our successes too. Um, Dr. Redmond, anything else to add? No, just thank you so much for those of you who took part in the um, in the draw. We have chosen the names and just 
At some point in the coming weeks, you're going to get an email from us. If you never get an email from us, it's because you didn't win. I want to thank, <laughs> so thank you, everyone. I want to thank all of the volunteers who have made this the second of three um, of these panels, uh, of these discussions, these sessions, um, such a, a, a vibrant and wonderful success. I hope to see you all next week when we'll be doing this again. Actually, Dr. S. Um, um, answer was a, a, a wonderful one to segue us into our conversation for next week, where will we be talking about Afrocentric research and decolonizing um, uh, and additional ways to decolonize Afrocentric practice. Thank you all. Thanks to our guests. Thanks to all who made this happen. Thank you to my co-host, Daniela. And um, we'll see you again next week. Thank you. See you next Bye, week. Bye, everyone. Thank you.